Good morning. Welcome to Dumbo Baptist Church. I want to read this morning from John's Gospel, chapter 13 and verses 1 to 20. <coughs> Excuse me, John, chapter 13 and verses 1 to 20. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it round his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterwards you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who it was who would betray him. That is why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet, and put on his outer garments, and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you were right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly. Truly I say to you, a master is not greater than his sorry, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled, he who ate my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I am telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Amen. Mighty God and loving Heavenly Father, thank you for this word of yours that we have read together. Thank you for the teaching it contains and thank you for the opportunity to consider how that teaching applies to us this morning. But Lord, we cannot do this in our own strength. We ask, Lord, for the enabling of your Holy Spirit that we may not only rightly understand the words but we may understand their application in a spiritual way also that we may see the hidden mysteries, that we may understand the depths of what is here in your word. Lord, speak to us and minister to us. Teach us, Lord. Teach us what we need to know. You know our spiritual situation. You know where we are with you. Lord, draw us closer. Take us from where we are and bring us nearer, Lord, so that we may know you better, love you better, worship you more truly and serve you more faithfully. Lord, deliver us from distracting thoughts and cares. Deliver us from all the hindrances and speak to us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Our subject, 
Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And our text found in John 13 and verse 12, where having done so, Jesus says, Do you understand what I have done to you? Now, the answer to that question had actually already been stated a few verses earlier in verse 7, where Jesus says to Peter, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterwards you will understand. So, although probably, as we shall see when we get a bit further on, the disciples probably were able to nod their heads and agree that they had understood, actually, at the time, they hadn't got a clue. They didn't really know what Jesus was doing. So, we have to look deeper than just the surface, because on the surface, it was probably a rebuke a fairly justly deserved rebuke for what was going on. Luke records that at the beginning of the Passover meal, there was a, uh, a bit of a power struggle going on. The uh, disciples were trying to decide which of them were, was the greatest. A dispute arose amongst uh, Yes, among them, as to which of them would be regarded as the greatest, Luke 22 and verse 24. And then Jesus goes on in verse 26, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is greater, the one who reclines at table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as one who serves, which may well have been a very suitable introduction to Jesus laying aside his outer garment and picking up the towel and washing their feet. So, on the surface, this action of Jesus was a, a practical lesson in humility and a rebuke to the disciples for their pride and uh, anxiety to be thought greater than others. John adds this story. It's not in Matthew, Mark or Luke. Only John records it. And John wrote his uh, gospel towards the end of the first century to, humanly speaking, to combat a heresy that was gaining ground that Jesus wasn't really God. Jesus was just a man. And John wrote this gospel concentrating on all the things which Jesus said and did that prove conclusively he is God. And so we should be looking for an answer, really, in that kind of area, because that's what John was mainly concentrating on. So let's look at it. Jesus washing our feet. The text in verse 12, do you understand what I've done to you? And I want to look at physical, spiritual, and practical. Physical, spiritual, and practical. Now, it was common courtesy at the time of writing to provide foot washing facilities for your guests. You remember there was that uh, time when Jesus was invited to the house of Simon, a Pharisee, and uh, Simon didn't bother with common courtesy. And after a woman had come and washed Jesus' feet with her tears, and Simon was uh, feeling that Jesus ought to have known better than to let the woman touch him, Jesus says to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. That's in Luke 7.44. So, Common courtesy to wash the feet. The disciples having a bit of an argument because none of them wished to do the job, possibly. Because it was the kind of job which a slave would do, or, or at least a very lowly servant. And um, Jesus does the job. Jesus washes their feet. Demonstrating by so doing, 
that he didn't change his status one iota. He had washed their feet, and he says in verse 13, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. Jesus didn't stop being their Lord and teacher because he washed their feet. They just had their feet washed by their Lord and teacher. Now we have this silly idea going on in our societies that what we do defines our position. Now, certainly, to some extent, that is true. If you're a bus driver, you drive buses. Uh, and if you're a politician, you work in politics. And if you're a prime minister, you work in the Houses of Parliament. So that, that, that makes sense. But really and truly, we are what we are, regardless of what we're doing. And John emphasises that Jesus was fully conscious of just who he is. In verse 3 and 4, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, laid aside his outer garment, taking a towel, tied it round his waist, and so on. Jesus was fully conscious of who he was. The idea that he would change who he was by serving somebody else is, is ridiculous. A dog remains a dog even if it's sitting on a king's throne. And God remains God even when he stoops to wash the feet of his creatures. Prince dressed up as a pauper is a prince nonetheless. What we do is an expression of what we are. And if we think we are too good, too important, too exalted to do some menial task, that just shows that we are proud. It doesn't show anything else about us. A king whose only business is to maintain an idea of his own importance is of no use whatsoever. The king has to serve his kingdom, to look after it, to plan for it, to care for it. A business boss whose only job is to prove he's greater than everybody else is no use. You need a boss who knows the business, who knows how to run it, how to make things good, and so on. So Jesus is giving a physical lesson. He is teaching people, teaching us, that we should serve one another. And it doesn't denigrate our position. It doesn't alter our standing if we are humble and serve other people. God is not less God because he cares about the smallest things in his creation. In fact, it's a sign of the glory of God that you look at the most complicated of his creation, and it's beautifully made, perfectly designed. And you look at the lowliest parts of God's creation, and it's beautifully made, perfectly designed. God spends the same amount of skill and effort on every part of his creation. God does all things well. Nobody is too insignificant for us to serve, for all people are made in the image of God. And if we serve them, we are serving God in his their image, in serving God in whose image they are made. No one is too great, or no one should be too great to be bothered about others, because the greatest, God Himself, Jesus Christ, gave everything to serve us. Jesus laid aside his glory, he gave up his position in heaven, he gave up his comfort. He gave up his life to serve us sinners who at the time when he was doing all those things hated him, didn't know him, didn't love him. God's love, God's perfection, God's glory, Jesus demonstrates it and the disciples probably got that. When, when Jesus asked the question, do you understand what I've done to you? They probably nodded, albeit shamefacedly. They, they got that message and Jesus explains it as well. But nonetheless, we still do get problems of pride, even within the church. 
there have been bishops and archbishops and clergy of various denominations who have thought themselves a bit too good for serving others. It should not be so. It's not wrong to have people in authority. In fact, overseers are God's gift to the church. But overseers are supposed to be servants, not served. Clues in the name. Minister means servant. Anyway, that was the physical lesson. And the disciples, who had been struggling for top position, too proud to serve each other, probably got the message. But Jesus had already said, as we remembered earlier, that... Uh, what I am doing now, you do not. Sorry, what I am doing, you do not understand now. From which we gather that the real message is spiritual. Our second point. The clue is in verse eight. Peter said to Jesus, "You shall never wash my feet." Jesus answered him, "If I do not wash you, you have no share with me." If I don't wash you, you have no share with me. If I don't wash you, Peter, you have got nothing to do with me. Nothing at all. So Peter said, oh, Lord, wash everything then. But Jesus refuses to do that because he'd already done it. You are clean. Not all of you, Judas wasn't, but all the rest, they're clean. So there was a, a, a bathing, which Peter couldn't remember happening. And there is the foot washing, which Peter didn't want to happen. And Jesus says, if I don't do these things, you've got no part in me. Clearly, this washing is something only Jesus can do. Now, if you have a look in <coughs> excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11, you read a list of all the things that Jesus had washed the Corinthian church from. Paul says there, Do you not know that the unrighteous, that's those who haven't been washed, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Look at that list. Things which are normal in our society, things which are not even seen as wrong in our society, and things which our society doesn't tolerate. They're all sins, whether we like them or not, and only Jesus can wash them away. He can do it, and he does do it, and if he doesn't do it, you're not part of his kingdom. The question is, when? Peter had been washed, and Peter has no recollection of it. Now, one of the things that all of Jesus' disciples did do was to be baptised. And some people have suggested that um, baptism's the time when sins are washed away. And if people don't get baptised, their sins are never washed away. So you have this idea of baptismal regeneration. If you can push everyone through the sheep dip, you turn them all into Christians. That doesn't work. That's rubbish. Judas had been through uh, baptism, just like all the others. And he was not clean. Jesus says so. But nonetheless, baptism is a picture of it. There are two pictures of baptism. First one is death and burial. You know, you, you, you die to your old nature. You die to your old life. <coughs> excuse me, you are buried with Christ under the water and you rise out of the water to a new life with Jesus. It's a picture. Romans 6 verse 4. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. 
Baptism is also a picture of washing. It's what you do with dirty clothes. You baptise them. And uh, in Acts 22 and verse 16, Paul is recalling the time when Ananias came to him and said to him, Why do you wait? Rise, be baptised and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so Paul did rise and was baptised and called on the name of the Lord and so on. But his sins had already been washed away. Baptism is just a, a physical symbol of what has happened. Christians don't physically die and come back to life again when they're saved, nor do uh, Christians uh, dive into a bowl of water and come out the other side when they're saved. It's a picture of a spiritual thing that has happened. Sin washed away. When? It's washed away by faith. When we trust in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sins washed away in the blood of the Lamb. That's a, a line from a hymn which is taken from Revelation 7 verse 14 where uh, the Apostle records that these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, Revelation's talking about washing clothes, washing your robes, making your garments pure and spotless and so on. But in Revelation 1 verse 5, we read about Jesus who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, or the authorised version, washed us from our sins by his blood. Or in 1 John 1 7, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. The washing is of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. When we believe in Jesus, when we trust him as our Lord and Saviour, when we trust him to take away our sins and make us acceptable to God, at that point we are spiritually washed. We are spiritually raised to new life, both those pictures in baptism. And once that has happened, you can't repeat it. Once you've been born again, you can't be born again and born again and born again because the life that Jesus gives is an eternal life. It cannot be repeated. You, you, sorry, you can't get it twice because you can never die. I should give them eternal life and they will never perish, Jesus said. So Jesus says to Simon, you know, you, you want me to wash you again? I can't do that. The one who was bathed does not need to wash except his feet. Yes, there must be daily cleansing from daily sin because we walk in a wicked world and we will get our feet dirty. So every day we must confess our sins. As uh, we, we have in 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So yes, a Christian is washed once when they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and daily as we confess our daily sins. Only Jesus can do this. And it is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that it is done. It's not a physical thing, it's a spiritual thing. And Judas had no faith and therefore was not clean. And a physical foot wash, even by Jesus himself, was of no spiritual use. Because faith must be in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, in his life given for our sins, a sacrifice made. And when the sacrifice was made, the one who made the sacrifice is free from sin. When Jesus took all our, our sins upon his shoulders, he was responsible for all our sins. He made the sacrifice. The sacrifice was accepted. All the sins paid for. Jesus came back to life, conquered death. That's the new covenant in uh, Luke Chapter 22 and verse 20. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. What an amazing covenant it is. Jesus takes and deals with all the consequences of our sin. And we, in exchange, are given Jesus' righteousness and all the consequences of his perfect obedience. That is the new covenant.
God is so gracious. And that's what's pictured here. Jesus daily washing the feet, caring for the men he has saved by his death. So a physical lesson in humility and a fact that most those who are most like Jesus are the ones who are most willing to serve, not those who are served. And spiritual picture of the total cleansing that is ours when we trust Jesus as Saviour. And of the daily need for confession of sin. Daily need for having our feet washed. So that's the, the physical and the spiritual. How about the practical? Jesus expected us to do something. Verse 15. I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done. And you can scour the Bible as much as you like and you won't find any record that I can think of of Christians routinely washing each other's feet. Clearly, that wasn't what Jesus wanted done. That wasn't the practical lesson from this. We shouldn't all instantly rush off and grab a bowl of water. Think of the mess it would make if everybody was simultaneously trying to wash everybody else's feet. That can't be done. Jesus expected us to do something. Obviously, that includes humbly serving one another as required. And obviously, that includes believing and being baptised as a symbol of having been cleansed in his blood and risen to new life. Yes. Daily confession of sin. Yes. That's what we've already said. But verse 15 says, I've given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. What had Jesus just done? OK, yes, I know he'd washed feet, but that, what, what, was, it, what was it proving? Well, we've said the washing of feet is a picture of daily sin being daily confessed and daily cleansed. And the disciples were all very well aware of their own feet. They would have known that however much they may have had a bath and put on their best clean clothes, their feet were a bit smelly because feet get hot, dusty and smelly in that part of the world. And they were probably fairly well aware of the feet of the people next to them as well. If their feet are anything like my feet, you don't have to be that close to be aware of them. And Paul points out the practical application of this in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual ought to restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too are tempted. Smelly feet is daily transgressions that need daily cleansing. And so you are aware that a brother has, spiritually speaking, smelly feet. He's sinning. And he needs your help to stop. Anyone is caught in any transgression. People are caught in a transgression usually don't realise it until afterwards. You that are spiritual, that is, you who haven't been caught in that one and can see what's gone wrong, restore them. Now you think about it. How often? You see somebody doing something stupid, something sinful, something wrong. You think, oh, would have thought better of them than that. And you walk away. And Jesus says, don't. You see somebody with dirty feet, you get on your knees and wash them. Help them. Point out to them their need of washing. 
somebody stepped in something nasty, help them clean it up. And also, if you've stepped in something nasty, don't be shy. Admit the fact and ask other people to help you clean up. Obviously you can't push this too far. Uh, there have been people who have claimed that they can forgive other people's sins. Uh, and so you, you have sort of little confession booths where you go and tell this wonderful person all your sins and they forgive you in God's name. They can't do that. Only God can forgive sins and, and we receive his forgiveness by our own faith, not by the faith of somebody else who passes the forgiveness on to us. But nonetheless, we have a practical daily ministry to look out for one another and also to ask help from one another. James chapter 5 verse 16, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. You know, there's some Christians around who you think are positively perfect. They never confess sin. They never admit fault. They never ask help. They never ask for prayer. Or if they do ask for prayer, it's always for somebody else's problems, never their own. We should ask help. We should minister to one another. That's what church fellowship should be about ministering to one another as Jesus ministered to his disciples. Now, okay, we, as I say, we can't push that picture too far because obviously, physically speaking, Jesus too needed his feet washed. He'd been walking around on dirty ground, but Jesus is sinless. We're not. We need our feet washing. We can't throw stones at anybody else for having stepped in something nasty on earth because we're all doing it all the time. So confess your sins one to another. Help one another. Pray for one another. Help one another to escape from sin which so easily clings to us. You know, some of us have besetting sins which we need constant help to get over. Constantly needing help to get out of uh, self-pity or bad temper or moaning about things or, or whatever it is, you know. That's what the church fellowship would be. We should be checking over one another's spiritual armour before battle, watching out for one another's backs during back battle. We should be constantly caring for one another. That's what Jesus said in John 13, 34, 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now that takes courage. It takes courage to confess your sins to one another because we have this idea that if we've sinned, we've somehow demeaned ourselves and become less of a Christian than we were. No, we're not Christians because we don't sin. We are Christians because we trust in Christ. And Christians are still Christians even when they have sinned. They've got their feet dirty. They're still washed. And we, you know, it's our pride which won't let us confess our sins to one another. Well, it takes courage. So we need to humble ourselves and admit we need help. But also it takes courage because if you're dealing with somebody else's feet, you're putting yourself in a position where you can get kicked in the face. And sometimes an erring brother or sister can be a bit nasty before they are convicted of their sin and restored to their situation in Christ. It takes courage to say to somebody, that's wrong, you shouldn't be doing that. That's not Christian. Now, of course, we all know plenty of people who are forever saying that kind of thing, and they come along with a list of rules that you should be keeping and all the rest of it. That's, we're not talking legalism here. We're talking about spirituality, things which make us more like Jesus, things that grow us more like our Saviour. I have left you an example that you should do as I have done. Jesus is constantly restoring us to clean and making us more like him.
And that's what we should be doing to each other, constantly praying for one another, helping one another to be more like Jesus. It takes courage. It takes humility. But then, it is such a glorious work. We would be doing exactly what Jesus did. We would be doing, well, as Jesus says, if I then, your teacher, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. I've given you an example that you should do just as I have done. This is my commandment, that as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. May God help us. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and thank you for his constant ministry to us. That if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, help us not to be proud and to feel that we somehow demean ourselves if we ask our brothers and sisters to pray for us. Lord, help us to be honest and open. And Lord, we pray that we may grow together in our dependence upon Christ more like Christ. Help us to make a correct application of these truths. Deliver us from all misunderstanding and grant us your blessing for Jesus' sake. Amen.